Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton, Jenny Froome, and Adebayo Adilike here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Uh, Jenny, first, how you doing? Really well. Really good. It is so good to see you again. I'll tell you, we've really, uh, we're spiking the football on this incredible series here. And we've got our dear friend, Adebayo. Adebayo, how you doing today? Uh, nice. I'm always high on life. Uh... Nice <laughs> to be here with Scott, Jenny, and our guest. You know, lovely, lovely. I'm with you. And if I could wake up with Jenny and out of bio every morning, I think I would get so much more done. It really, y'all got, y'all got a vibe and energy and and um, an action that makes the world a better place. But hey, today we're continuing our supply chain leadership across Africa series in conjunction, of course, with our friends at Safex and Supply Chain Africa. So Jenny Froome serves as COO at SayPix, which is doing wonderful work from a professional development and a networking standpoint. And Adebayo Adilike is a founder of Supply Chain Africa, which is a digital platform with a singular mission to advance African supply chains. Love that. Um, but guess what? It gets even better. So as if Jenny and Adebayo wouldn't make for a great episode, we've got two other leaders that were really were just over the moon. Uh, and tickled they could they could be here with us. Uh, first up, uh, Tapiwa Mukwashi, Director, Global Technical Team at Village Reach. Tapiwa, how you doing? Hi, Scott. It's, it's good to be here, and thanks for having us on the show. You bet. We, we got so much to cover. Thanks for taking some time out. And you're joined by a colleague, Tawanga Mkandawiri, uh, Global uh, Team, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Director uh, and Team Lead, for global supply chain at Village Reach. Tawange, how you doing? Great, Scott. I'm so glad to be here with both you and uh, Jenny and Adebayo. Looking forward to a great conversation. We are too. And you see, my uh, my tongue tried to get me in trouble there, right? We, we, we're, always, <laughs> we're always making last minute additions and changes to our uh, to our uh, notes here, but congrats on what I believe is a, is a recent promotion and so excited to dive more into both your and Tapiwa story. So with all of that, I think we have uh, effectively set the table a bit. And Jenny, I want to start with you. Where, where are we starting with our incredible guests here today? Well, I think we're going to start at the very beginning and ask Tuange and Tapiwa if you would like to share with us where you actually grew up. So we'll start with ladies first. We'll start with Tawonge, and you tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Oh, sure thing. Um, it was nice being a lady. Always good to go first. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, most days. But anyways, I was born in uh, Malawi, which is um, Central Africa. Spent the first um, 11 odd years of my life there. And then uh, my parents and I moved to Namibia um, in Zambezia province. So. If you look at the map of Namibia, it's the finger that's sticking out on the, on the one side. So that's where I grew up. Hmm, thanks. And Tapiwa. And so, you know, Jenny, Village Ridge focuses on the last mile. And um, I must say, um, I'm from Zimbabwe and I, I grew in what grew up in what we can call the last mile. Um, I'm from the Manekalen province in Zimbabwe. Um, I studied right up until my first degree in Zimbabwe. So I'm really very much Zimbabwean, um, locally driven, globally connected, that's how we call it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think the experience that I've had growing up in the environment that I did uh, is equipping me to be able to work across a number of countries supporting supply chain improvements in the last mile. Um, improvements that I'm really motivated to contribute to because of what I've seen growing up. So very glad to be here and to be talking mm. about a subject that I'm very passionate about. 
Hey, yeah, Jenny. Absolutely. Yeah. Re- really quick. I had to. So Tuange, as both of uh, Tuange and uh, Tapi was, was sharing, I had to go ahead and pull up a map. Yeah, I'm a big yeah. map nerd, <laughs> right? And <clears throat> that as the, the finger that Tuange was talking about, I see that, that both Namibia and Zimbabwe are kind of in the southern half of the continent, right? Mm-hmm. You got Botswana that, that separates the two. But um, for our viewers, as they're kind of trying to picture on the map exactly where uh, these landmarks are, the kind of southern half of the continent and, of course, South, South Africa at the bottom uh, there of Africa. But um, to complete, so, Jenny, you're in South Africa. I believe you're in Johannesburg, yep. right? Yep, yep. So, out of bio, to kind of finish that, before, I, before we get back to J- Jenny and the personal journeys, personal way back in the beginning with our guests, where are you uh, currently out of bio and, and where are you from? Oh, uh, you know, born and raised in Nigeria. We had a kind of a little bit west, but not central. Uh, it depends on how you look at it, but a little west. Uh, actually, I just returned from Nigeria uh, after about two weeks uh, doing my rendezvous over there uh, from Supply Chain Africa. So you am back in the States right now. So and then just for a breather and then head back to Africa again. So, yeah. Man. So you uh, have... You have a whole African surrounding you now from south to the east. No, from southeast and then into central. So love yeah. that. Yeah. The movers and shakers. Yeah. Uh, I think Adebayo lives in an airplane these days. I think he was <laughs> Jenny, as we were prepping for this one. I think he was uh he was Ubering from one meeting to the next. So it's good to That's it's good right. to have him here today. Um all right. That's so. it. But so if you're if you're a map nerd, there's a game that you need to find for yourself. It's called, you know, there's this this game that's the real trend that's called Wordle. Right. There's an there's another game that's called World. Oh, so it's W-O-R-L-D-L-E. Okay. And it shows you outlines of countries. That's all. You just get an outline of the country and you have to identify where that you've got five guesses, I think, to guess wow. which country it is. Okay. So, all, all, you, all you international folk, that's a, that's a change from the word one. So have a, have a, have a look at that. Um, and, and, you know, sort of found by our grandson who's staying with us at the moment from Kenya. So the Africa connection continues. Um, and, yeah, and, and talking about young people and, and connections. Um, Tapira, have you got a, a sort of a childhood memory that you want to share with us that sort of was, has stood out for you? Mm-hmm. I do, you know. Um, you know, I, I work with Tiwonge a lot and um, she knows how driven I am. I'm very results oriented. I'm very focused on achieving outputs, outcomes. Um, and once I get to do something, there's no stopping to it. Um, and in my family, we three boys. Um, I learned very early on to survive, um, to demand my space, to you know uh, focus on getting the kind of things I wanted um, because it is a very competitive environment. So I'm thinking that this childhood I have with three older brothers, I'm the youngest. Um, of course, externally, they would look out for me, uh, but within the home, um, <laughs> they had to look out for themselves as well. And, and so um, I, I think the kind of drive that I have, um, the competitive nature in me, the go-getter, go-getter nature in me to some of those childhood um, experience, I, I, I would say it was a form of in, involuntary learning that's uh, allowed me to survive. Um, yeah. When I think about growing out of Zimbabwe, um, starting to work regionally and internationally, I found the Nigerians very competitive. Oh, um, yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found the, the Kenyans very competitive. I found the Ugandans very competitive. Um, I, I did a part of my study in South Korea. I, I thought the Chinese are driven, like there's no stopping once they start studying. The South Koreans, look at all the innovation they're having. Um, they can literally work 24 um, seven. I, I think I've been able to cope in a more diverse environment, in a growing environment, um, because growing up, I never knew what giving up meant. and um, 
I, I've learned a lot. I've used a lot of the lessons learned in my life to, to keep fitting into a space, um, you know, that inquire, requires me to work with people from diverse cultures, with diverse work approaches, uh, knowing that we are all pursuing the same thing. We want to achieve good, to do good yeah. in the world. That's fantastic. You know, sibling rivalry, whatever, however you like to call it, um, nurture, fighting, bullying, it's always, it, it makes us stronger in the end. It and does. that's a really it great does. example. You've, uh, you've got twins, haven't you, Adabai? I do. I do. And I watch them daily debates. And uh, I have a liberal minded daughter and I have a conservative son. So yeah. it's always a very interesting uh, conversation. But uh, just to, uh, for the pure, a very interesting actually pointed as the last child. Mostly I found the middle child being the one that is out there by themselves. Most middle children are always, because nobody really care, they only care about the first child and the last child. So most middle <laughs> children are always like on their own. They'll do all the craziest things. Because most of the people I've met from the big family, I always ask them, you are the middle child? I say, yep, because you, there are certain attributes that who's out of them. You're like, oh, this guy's way out there, you know? But it's always the middle children that is always very interesting, but I'm, I'm glad that at least. And also the, the last child too can be bullied a lot growing up. So they have to kind of fight for their Brilliant. independence. So I mm-hmm. see from uh, uh, from Tapua's point of view that, you know, being a, being a last child can be very interesting. I'm the second to the last. So I thought I was the last for a while and then, they had my brother, <laughs> and, then, so, and, and then that took my shine, you know. But uh, but the most yeah. part, it's quite interesting. Out of bio, yeah, I got to share because uh, uh, I'm similar similar note there. Um, I've got one brother and one sister, but for the longest time, it was me and my brother. And then uh, we got surprised with a sister, and and I was moved from the bedroom to they converted our dining room into a bedroom, uh, and that was I'll have to uh, share that story one time. But hey. You know, you never know. You think you're the last person and we always surprises are nonstop. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, my brother was like, who is this kid? Who is this kid? I was always <laughs> taking my shine. I think I, I was I was very rebellious because I was like, you know, initially, initially I was happy for it. And then I realized that he started taking all the attention. I was like, wow, yeah. you know, it's not like I'm an attention kind of person, but you, know, you always like to be the last person, everybody. But now, you know, but it's very interesting how yes. our formative years kind of shape the way and who we become as an adult. Mm-hmm. You know, some of those things, some of those fights that you have to do and how you kind of make your stand. So I can understand from the people's perspective, especially in the African environment where things, and you have to pretty much fight for everything. You have to fight for, mm-hmm. the, I mean, the only thing that you can't fight for is your air. I mean, the way things are going these days, becoming the, it's very it's becoming a rare commodity. But almost everything, I mean, uh, is a challenging environment. The whole continent that yeah. is that, that we are coming to kind of uh, grapple with. So I completely understand. So trust me, that the Americans, the 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 Koreans, and the rest of the world has nothing on you because what you've gone through, uh, it's it's a challenge on its own. And I don't think anyone has to contend with that. But it's very interesting. I think and I, and to. To, uh, to, to kind of caveat to what uh, the speaker said, I think that growing up in an African setting gives you a different flavor and a different perspective and able to appreciate and be more to be more globally fitted for the role that you might be trusted into uh, down the line. So on that note, and, and getting back to you, Jenny, and, and, and I, love, mm-hmm. I love how much we've baked into uh, this front end uh, competition and, and, and fighting for what you want and, and um, you know, never stopping. So Jenny, back to you. Cause this is just, that's just our first guest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I was going to say, looking at Tawange's face, I'm putting money on the fact she's a middle child. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I'm wrong. I was one of the few that held on to the prize, you know, so I'm the last <laughs> one. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> and then Scott who um, got the surprise one. I was the surprise. So uh. <laughs> I held on to that space and, uh, I think I was, I, I wouldn't say I was spoiled. It's just, I've always been given my space. Um, treasured. So, yeah, treasured, pushed, yes. Um, and I think, you know, my, my siblings have played a big role in, yes, we'll kind of let you do your own thing, but you must do your thing. You have to do something. Um, you're not just here to laze about, um, which is something that has definitely come into play in, in, in my life and, and in the mm. work. 
get things done, get things done, whether on my own or as part of a team. Um, and I have that confidence in being able to do that work a lot because of that, that support and the push from, from my family. I think growing up um, with the one memory that, um, it's actually a, a bunch of memories, I think. Um, they all revolve around kind of the walks from school to home. Um, so it's like a big rush, leave school, rush and play along the road, get home, drop off the bags and just grab food quickly and go back and play. Um, and then, you know, kind of be surprised when it's time to go back home and mom is driving or being driven down to get home and you need to rush and get into the house. Before. <laughs> um, what sticks out about that is that sense of community. Um, so yeah. Tofu and Adebayo mentioned how on this continent, yes, you, you do need to, to fight for, for your place, but I think there's also a really amazing sense of community and um, people always coming together, good times and bad, to get things to work, which is something that I think is, is quite um, unique. Um, and it's something that I think we, we need to leverage more, especially as we look at public health supply chains, how to tap into the power of the community to actually get yeah. services to the very same people. Um, so, yeah. I, I yeah. love it. I love it. And to caveat to it, I think last ones, uh, the last uh, last burns of the family, I think they are more, they experience more parenting. Being that most of the earlier children have been just experimentation. Kids, the, the most, the parents be like, you know what, we don't know what we're doing, but we get it. But the last one, they've been through one or two of them already, they experience, they know what to do and what not to do. So I think most people always refer last child as being spoiled, but not really. I think they just experience better parenting for the most part, because the parents will have, you know what, we did this, it didn't work with this guy, we did this, maybe let's try this last one. I think it will, and that's what I always, in the view of it, because I have a last child too. I believe she's spoiled. I really do believe she's spoiled, but I think she's <laughs> better parenting for her. <laughs> so Je Jenny, uh, we got together for a supply chain conversation and a parenting conversation and like a psychology uh, broke out. But, but isn't everything supply chain? You see, right, so it is. But it's so <laughs> true. It is so fascinating. And and Adabayo, I, I love your your. First off, I love uh, Twange and Tapiwa. You sharing what you've shared on the earliest part of your journey. Uh, Twange, I think those, you know, what you learn on those walks to and from school and those drives to and from school are so critical. And I think many of us can relate to that. Uh, Adabayo, I love how you mentioned parents by the time the third or fourth child may. Or, or beyond rolls around, they get they benefit from all the proven parenting mm -hmm. approaches from the experiments. That, that, that's so cool. But Jenny, um, I'd love to you know spend a couple hours on this segment. But we want to talk about one of our favorite topics here before we we bring it uh, past baton out of bio, right? Yeah, yeah. Food, 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 and it's that time of day for me where we have to talk food. Um, we. I want to know from, from each of you one dish that either evokes childhood memories or is some, something that you just is synonymous with home. And that's over to you, Tuongo. What's your one number one food? Hey. Um, <laughs> it's, it's my favorite uh, part of the house. Um, now, Tuongo, I think we might have missed well, We missed that. We missed that. But you didn't get what I said. Oh, tribe. You know the inside. Tribe. Oh, tribe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We might have some things in common. <laughs> no, happy memories. Um, my dad would always make sure that he has some in the fridge when I was coming back from boarding school of varsity. So happy memories with tribe. Amazing. Well, I got I got a quick follow-up <laughs> there because yeah. um when I've consumed tripe, it was in uh Vietnamese uh, uh Vietnamese uh, uh, Vietnamese pho, right? Pho, the, the bowl of soup yeah, yeah. is one of the yeah. common common dishes I've had with tripe. What's what's one of your favorite dishes that tripe goes into to one game? Um, so we normally just cook it. Um, just try. Just try. Well, you eat it with, um, you know, you'd have like vegetables and and sima, which is what it's called in Malawi. So it's a mini meal uh, porridge, not soft porridge, but a hard one. Adebayo, I think in Nigeria, it's, it's fufu or something like yes, that. Yes, fufu, vegetables. I didn't even get it in pepper yeah. soup. Mm. Not so much pepper soup, so soup in Malawi, but definitely <laughs> the salsa in Zimbabwe, the tribe and the vegetables 
it's the perfect trio. Yeah. It's also, I mean, it was very popular in, in the UK in the sort of the 60s. I remember my grandmother used to love tripe. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that's gone out of fashion oh, yeah. in, in, in England. I so know you, that. You're saying, Jenny, it's a universal uh, uh, bridge food to bring us all together around tripe. Mm. You, you never know. Maybe. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. Um, could catch on. Everyone listening here may think, oh, I'll go try it. We've started a whole new craze. Right. Uh, <laughs> to <laughs> to Piwa. So, you know, I, I, I'm hearing the conversation on tribe and I'm thinking like, okay, I like tribe. Um, you know, it's the kind of food that when you get an acquired test, you, you, you just can't stop. It's with age, you start to love it more. But, but growing up, and I think it was driven more from a point of scarcity than plenty, was um, I like peanut butter and rice with mm. this traditional rice um, that's ground up and mixed with peanut butter. So I like that for the starch. And even up to now, if I have it, there's no stopping. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed it, particularly when it's served together with, with oxtail. Um, and so I'm why, why is it that I was so I loved oxtail so much um, I, I'm now realizing that you know when you killed the cow in the village um, it was once in, in a year or twice in a year and that's at the point that you'd get oxtail you know and mm-hmm. I, I walk into the supermarket and there are all these shelves with oxtail I'm like where do these cows come from now, you know? Um, so right now, um, that childhood dish is continuing to be my favorite dish. So I will have peanut butter rice anytime with, with oxtail. That does it for me. Um, if, if I could have for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, <laughs> wonderful. And so uh, I'm, I'm not very complicated. Uh, so my kids can't understand. Like, I have no time for pizza. Um, I have no time for to, to go to some of the Italian restaurants with them to, 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 to eat um, spaghetti or the macaroni. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking like, when can we get back to get yeah. to what I really call food? So it's something that's um, and I, 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 I love it today. That's great. Oxtail, I, it's the whole slow food movement, isn't it? To eat the whole the whole beast or not waste anything. And it's something I think we all need to be much more conscious of. So thanks very much for sharing those and your, and your early years as well. And now um, Adabaya is gonna take you to the next level so that we get to know you further into your careers and your lives. It's been fascinating so far, it's exciting. Uh, thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, I'm an equal opportunist when it comes to food. <laughs> uh, but one thing I did not like growing up was eating beans uh, for some strange reason. My mom loved it. Uh, and she always cooked it like almost every day. So you can only imagine I have to starve myself to prevent myself from eating beans. But for every other thing else, I'm game. Anyway, so uh, it's just nice uh, hearing from, you know, uh, Tapua and Tawange just experience, but you know what? I'll go from, let's go, you know, back, back way. So who inspired you as a child? Uh, I'll go, I'll start with uh, Tapiwa. Who inspired you as a child growing up? I know you grew up in a village area, but at least some kind of, you got some kind of inspiration. Yes, absolutely. Uh-huh. I, go I did, I did, by the way. Um, my brother actually, um, and I'll explain why, you know, at, at the time that my brother grew up, uh, there was one university in Zimbabwe. Um, getting into university was like uh, one child in the whole district. I looked at my brother through high school. He went to boarding school first. He wore the blazer in the family first. And just looking at him, so dignified, so elegant, and I just wanted to be like him when wow. he qualified to go into university and to celebrate his achievement. Um, I, I knew right there that this is what I wanted. 
I wanted to go to university first. Uh, going to university sounded like a good idea. Um, he is also somebody that I've always looked at as somebody based with good judgment, very patient. Um, he's got such profound wisdom. If you turn to him for, for advice, his advice is almost was and he's almost always so balanced. Um, so he's been an inspiration to me ever since I was young. And I'm glad that he's continued to be a big fan of light even as we continue to, to grow. So I, I will pick my brother. Um, I, I could say I've learned a couple of other things, perseverance, tenacity from my mom, my dad, but um, childhood intrigue. Uh, was driven more by some of the achievements that my brother did that took him out of the village. That's quite interesting uh, uh, that, you know, our early and formative years, uh, we have uh, family members to kind of look up to, especially, but you can only imagine who your brother actually look up to because for he, for you to look up to him, can see so much pressure um, from your parents for him to set the standard for you guys to follow. And I think most firstborns in African communities will always have that kind of, they have that kind of fiduciary responsibility to kind of set the standard, set the tone, because they'll be like, what are you doing? Don't you see your siblings gonna be watching you? Every step you make, they're gonna be watching you. So uh, your your experience is, 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 is quite, uh, you know, kind of Absolutely. towing that line of him being your role model. And I really, uh, that's quite actually touching because it shows a lot about the family values, it shows a lot about our community, our value system in the African communities, how it is, uh, it set the tone for everything else. Family is the nucleus of our society. And, you know, gaining those kind mm -hmm. of, you know, your brother being our role model means, I mean, the world to you and could still continue to be a world to you. So God, thanks for sharing that. Um, so over to you, uh, mm -hmm. to one game. Mm -hmm. And so the who inspired you as a child? Sure thing. So I, I think for me, it's a, it's a clear, um, my mother. Um, and it was more about how she um, talked to us, the, the kind of encouragement that she would provide to us. Um, she's pushed all of us um, to work hard, do um, as much as we can, give whatever we do in our best. Um, but what I've always found so comforting was, you know, after doing all the pushing, she would be like, no matter what, you know, your father and I will be here, no matter what, we will support you. And you have, and she always had this phrase, the Mount Everest of support. Um, so it was always great if you're, you know, in boarding school um, or in res and varsity when things are going tough and, you know, she's on the phone, there were no video chats. Um, she was on the phone and she's like, you know, just imagine Mount Everest of support. Um, so for me, it, it, you know, gave me that space to, to grow, to try and, you know, still be okay if I fail because I could picture that Mount Everest of support still, still being there. So. Uh, that's I love that. Uh, that, that. That's, I mean, there's so many takeaways already, Jenny and Adebayo from our guests here today. Uh, but that that Mount Everest of support, I'm going to shamelessly steal that to from your mother, uh, because, you know, beyond the fact that so there's so much meaning and value there, but never really thought about it. But the visual that you can instantly have in your mind, you know, even the most trying hours of the day, I mean, that, that, that's very powerful. Um, and we may have. Um, we may have lost to Piwa just for a second. I'll keep an eye on uh, on, on the invite log. But uh, Adebayo, Jenny, so, man. Go ahead, Jenny, before I come in. Yeah. I was just going to say, I totally, I totally agree. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to have parents who were just the most supportive parents in the world, but obviously not. But we all, you know, we those who of us who are lucky enough. But I love that exactly as you say, Scott, that image of the Mount Everest of support. I'm also going to steal it. I'm going to go over and tell my grandchildren that exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, and, and uh, Tuangi, thanks for uh, kind of sharing that because it's very synonymous to African parents that uh, even in your adulthood, they are still there praying for you, concerned about your well-being. 
Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I've lived in several cultures and, I've, and I know most parents are always concerned about their culture, but African parents are extra. Uh, they, are, they are very extra. They have extra dose of concern, even to their death, even to their age in their 90s, they're still worrying about you as your child. Have you eaten? You looking thin? You this? I mean, I'm like, wow, this, you know, and if you look across, regardless of how well you've lost weight, as your wife not feeding you, is all this. I mean, it's very interesting and how African parents are, but it's just to show you of how overwhelming the love and the community and how our value system is. And uh, so what you shared is very, is, is quite important because our, our, our parents are, the, are pretty much our, the greatest influence that we have uh, growing up. And it's, uh, it's very interesting that even till now, you know, uh, you know, I was my, my kids are raised in the US. I told those guys, you know, they're about to be 18. I say, guys, you know, uh, you know, when you're 18, man, you know, you you adopt. You know, now you can I'm gonna kick you out of the house. My wife just look at me and be like, Where are you taking them to? I was like, oh, that's true. You know, <laughs> because in our community we we don't do we I mean we don't do that. Even you be you're surprised that even if you don't have a place to go, your 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 parents' house is always open. They have open doors. Unfortunately, of course, in your adult, you're not going to go back to your parents. So, but it's just like, hey, it's always that circle for a lot of us. So, you know, thanks to all our parents for what they do for that, uh, you know, that unwavering support they've given us over the years. So, thank you, uh, uh, you know, to Angie for sharing that. You know, special love to your mom and all, and the rest of the family. And the same thing for Topiwa as well. Mm -hmm. So, and Adebayo, um, yeah. you know, just reflecting on the same uh, subject, I'm glad that Tionke was sharing about your mom. Um, just reminds me of a book I read by Russell Cornwall, um, Acres of Diamonds. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes we try and look for inspiration in very far away places, and yet the inspiration is right around us. Yes. Uh, just look around you, there's somebody to inspire you. There's somebody to lift you up, to uplift you and provide, you know, that kind of inspiration you need to make it to the next next stage in life. Wow. As as that's deep. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, man. Thanks for that. There's always inspiration around us. There's always. And you're absolutely right. Every morning, you know, I wake up, I'm like, man, people are looking for something to inspire them. Just to be alive is an inspiration in itself. Uh, it's an inspiration in itself. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, to people for sharing that. So I'll go back to uh, Tuange again. So Tuange, so how did you get into the work you are doing today? I know you've had some uh, some shared experience. So uh, how did you get to uh, to what you are doing today? Just walk us through your your professional, your personal journey, if they are intertwined or not. Definitely intertwined. Um, I was I was reflecting back just now on on where it all started, and, and once again, it started with my mother. Uh, you know, um, I, I think as, as children and girls especially, there's always that time when you butt heads with, with your mother. Um, and we definitely had a butting of head moment when I was choosing what to go study in varsity. I wanted to go dentistry and law and I wanted to apply everywhere for that. And my mother was like, you know, people can happily live with a, a, an aching tooth for, for a while, but as soon as someone has a headache, they will go into a pharmacy. So why don't you go study pharmacy? Um, so I agreed to apply to one place for a pharmacy degree and lo and behold, that's the one that I got accepted for first. And yeah, I did my pharmacy um, undergraduate degree at Rhodes University in the Eastern Cape, beautiful Eastern Cape in South Africa. Um, and then from there, um, I think that the journey kind of grew organically you know, as I do, did my master's in public health. Um, I, I started to, to better understand um, some of the tools and, and things that are out there that can help address some of the challenges that I grew up seeing. So I grew up seeing relatives, you know, spending time in hospitals, coming back, um, in, in, in more, um, more times than one, not having received the medicine that they needed or being told, oh, I only came back with Panadol, which is paracetamol for, for a lot of, for some who might not know, even if you know, their condition required a lot more. So I only came back with Panadol and I was asked to go and buy 
um, medicine, either at the pharmacy or somewhere else. And in most cases, these were people that did not have money to pay for that medication. Um, and it's, it's things that I grew up seeing, it's things that I'm still seeing, it's, it's challenges that, that are real, that, that exist. Um, there are children out there that are not being vaccinated. There are children that are not um, you know, able to get antibiotics to treat, um, to treat the illness that they have. Um, very high mortality still for mothers and children. So I, I think my, my different roles, um, all of them involved um, you know, looking at how we can improve pharmaceutical systems and healthcare supply chains in general, so that we have less and less of those instances where children are not able to get access to the care that they need just because of a failure in the system. Um, so that is what's gotten me into this work and it's, it's what keeps me in this work. Um, yeah. Wow, that's really very interesting. You know, I've always, uh, I was talking to someone about two weeks ago, it was like, they were talking about looking at healthcare supply chain in Africa. It seems as if it's dominated by pharmacists. I was like, hmm, interesting. And to be honest, I can count about 20 on top of my head right now that are pharmacists and you just uh, put a high on the cake. But it makes sense. It does make sense of why pharmacists are quite concerned about the, <clears throat> the chain of custody of uh, drug supplies to move from point, of, you know, point A to point B. So I, I get it. And actually, who's best to actually... I understand that, make sure the drugs are done and you know, they're not being adulterated along the line. So it's absolutely, actually there's some crazy ideas that I'm just going through my head as you're talking about how drugs uh, and supply chain of drugs across the continent. It just, it just it's a flash of new idea right now. You know, I don't know. I'm, after this podcast, I'm gonna kind of let it marinate, but thank you for sharing that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, wow, it's, it's very interesting. Wow, very interesting. You have it. We have. We have to have one more thing. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking about pharmacists um, in public health supply chains. We've had long debates with colleagues and, and a few others um, about the role that pharmacists play versus supply chains specialists, supply chain professionals. Um, and as a result of that, I think for a long time I've started saying I'm a recovering pharmacist <laughs> because. I think sometimes we, um, we tend to perhaps overplay the role that pharmacists are supposed to play when it comes to ensuring that the commodities get to where they need to be. I think, you know, and we can have a conversation about this on another day, there's a role there for making sure that the pharmaceutical care is provided, that the right products are selected for the country, um, and all of that, which is more on the pharmacist, pharmaceutical side of things, the manufacturing, all of that. But then there is what is the most efficient way to source um, and get that product to where it's going. And we really need to start bringing the, bringing the two um, families together, community, you know? <laughs> yeah, actually, you're speaking music to my head because I think the case can be made of having supply chain courses in our pharmaceutical schools across the continent. I think there's a need for it because a lot of people are trusted into that role when they figure out they don't like being a researcher or they don't like being a hospital pharmacist. They like to be on the road. A lot of them are marketers, you know. Uh, I know about this because I get to, I have a lot of friends that are pharmacists and in a lot of them, if you're marketing a particular drug, so you have to understand how to get it from point A to point B. And then you, hence, you get into supply chain of it and the warehousing of it and all that kind of stuff. So, I, 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 you know, you and I, I think we, we're on the same note. Mm -hmm. We speak the same, uh, I don't, do we want to say something, Scott? I, I was just going to say, um, going back to the ear, earlier part of Tuange's answer, to you know, see the challenges uh, and, ex, and experience that maybe family members that she was talking to, I, I picked up on kind of how that resolve of hers to do something about it was really um, steeled uh, or um, it, it became a very real thing. And, and that's what I hear that's really drives a Tuange uh, day in and day out now. And that's a, I'll tell you, when you can see challenges and, and to people, I want to get your, your take on this too, but when you see challenges that, you know, all societies, communities have, and to be put in a position of leadership to drive action, to, to really address that, it's got to be incredibly fulfilling. And what we're going to talk mo more about village, vo village reach. I keep wanting to say village voice, village reach. 
uh, momentarily. But uh, if I could, out of bio, with your permission, if I could extend your same question to, to Piwa as we're Absolutely. talking about, you know, what mm-hmm. got you into this line of work before we dive deeper into Village Reach? Thanks, Scott. Um, and I just wanted to pivot a little bit on the conversation that was happening earlier because um, it delves into why this conversation on professionalization is absolutely important. What skills, what competences would be needed for someone to competently discharge their roles and responsibilities in a supply chain sense? And so basing on assumptions that pharmacists are the best or not the best um, kind of does not drive us towards that end state we're desiring. And I was smiling when Tiwonge was putting the disclaimer on the uh, the role that pharmacists have to play and non-pharmacists have to play. I was thinking, you know, Tiwonge is, is, is creating a runway for me to take off the, uh, <laughs> because um, while we work in the same space with Tiwonge, I, I, I'm not a pharmacist. Um, I, I'm more from a logistic background. Um, I, I started off my career working in a, a sugar manufacturing and distribution, distributing concern. I moved on to one that manufactures beverages, um, beverages um, distribution and manufacturing, um, a, a, a subsidiary of SAB Miller. And uh, having worked for Coca-Cola because the company is a distributor of Coca-Cola products, I, I, I just got the sense that there's got to be something much bigger. Um, I got more acquainted with some of the debates around, well, why is it that we can get Coca-Cola in very difficult places, but we can't get uh, medicine in, in the same places? Um, so, and uh, because- Tepiwa, hang on, hang on one second. We got to spike the football out of bio. That deserves a bingo. Jenny, that deserves a hallelujah from the mountaintops. That's such a, and, and I'm not going to pick on Coca-Cola, but the greater point to Piwa is making is, you know, why can't, what, you know, we can get, it's amazing. All the products across the globe, we can get whatever, whatever flavor, whatever, you name it, we get it there. But we have these greater challenges with, with these critical supplies uh, and beyond just the COVID-19 vaccine, all healthcare supplies. Why can't we apply the same, this is how we do it. Um, mentality to that to Piwa. That is golden. And I think it's a question we all should, you know, keep front and center. And you're absolutely right. Uh, We've had this discussion over and over again. Why is it that certain brands have better penetration in the market Mm -hmm. that or they are very life-saving things that we need? You know, we shouldn't be struggling with uh, distributing COVID vaccine. It should be, it should be get-go. I mean, we shouldn't be using CVS and, uh, you know, Walgreens, I mean, already established infrastructure. I mean, they, they're great. I'm not saying that what they did was wrong, but those things shouldn't be even be debatable. Ability mm-hmm. to get uh, life-saving medications and life-saving drugs uh, shouldn't be something that is used to be an afterthought or you have to go to the drawing table. It should be already established framework that facilitates such movement. So I, I you know, we can, it's, I know it's beyond the scope of this uh, podcast, but that could be another podcast in itself mm-hmm. about how, why, you know, because, you know, we, I can even tie it to the military, you know, uh, when General Petraeus, when he was a uh, head of, uh, uh, you know, that mission in Afghanistan, told everyone, you know, no pizza, nothing, because all these things is hybrid, is competing with the supply chain to move bu- guns and bullets and everything mm-hmm. that you need to fight the war. So, the, you know, there's, there is a lot to be uncovered, to unhurt when it's, when having this conversation. So not to take away from what uh, the power is saying, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, and because that question to people was just brought up uh, in a different version can be applied to many things uh, out of bio uh, yeah. across global supply chain. But so yeah. to people, you, uh, we're all big fans. Uh, I've got, I may, I may just have to go out and get a Tapiwa Takwashi <laughs> uh, uh, tattoo on my left shoulder here. But oh, nice. So thank you for letting it. us interrupt mm-hmm. you for just a second because what you shared mm-hmm. was golden. But please continue your, your point there. And then we're going to move into uh, Village Reach and the story there. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and so it's this experience and the discipline um, that's involved in terms of manufacturing a service, uh, the services across the supply chain, you know, developing them, 
implementing them uh, with, with the kind of dexterity that's needed or that's applied in the private sector. Um, I, I, I joined um, a, a big organization, no, not for profit, um, one of the UN agencies, I must say. And, and it, it is from there that my interactions with medicines, the challenges that medicines are facing to get to the last mile um, started. And I, I, I've not stopped growing from there. Um, I've developed through experience, you know, working in different in environments, graduating out of the more operational side of the supply chain to the more strategic side, uh, focused on uh, system design, uh, focusing on strengthening leadership, system strengthening. And this is what has seen me um, work in a number of countries across Africa, um, in West Africa, in, in, in Southern Africa, whilst Tiwonge uh, grew up and schooled in, in, in Namibia. I, I worked in Namibia for a, a couple of years, um, leading a, a regional project um, to end malaria in, in Southern Africa. And by both experience and exploiting the foundational skills that I have, uh, I'm also a voracious reader. You asked earlier in the, in the show, uh, what is it about your childhood that sticks out? One of the things that sticks out is that both my parents were teachers. Um, everything uh, discipline-wise always ended up in uh, some lesson, being taught something, being forced to read something. Uh, I developed a, a voracious appetite for reading at, at that early stage. Um, and I figured, okay, if I have a master's degree, am I going to get another master's degree to understand <laughs> another subject? Three <laughs> master's degrees, four master's degrees? Absolutely not, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to engage in continuous professional development uh, to acquire the skills that make me more effective at, at work. Uh, and so my appetite for reading, my appetite for knowledge acquisition is continue to refine how I cross learn, learn things from new industries and apply them in the work that I do on a daily basis. So um, I've moved from the private sector to the not-for-profit sector, work very closely with governments. And I think I'm in a good space to, uh, you know, trigger transformation. And to, tr and to create an impact. Uh, absolutely. And then to Piwa, we need more folks with you and Tawanga's uh, background not just in global supply chain, but global business and, and global leadership. So thank you for sharing. I, I want to move right along. Um, it, it's amazing the, what, just what I've learned, thanks to Adebayo and Jenny, uh, about the work that Village Reach is doing. And, and y'all clearly have lots of fans across the globe. But I want to give you all a chance. And Tawangi, I want to pose this to you first, and then we'll, we'll circle back to, uh, to Piwa. Uh, but tell us, if you would, in a nutshell, uh, about the work that Village Reach uh, is doing, right, and where it's doing it. So Tawanga, let's start there. Sure. Um, you know, as you were asking that question, I was, I was reflecting on, on that saying that, you know, birds of a feather tend to flock together. Um, and listening to the comments that the has been making, um, it's resonating. I'm not too surprised we both ended up at Village Reach, which is essentially um, um, a team of very dedicated, very passionate people are working to transform health services for everyone. We want to get to a time where everyone that needs health care, particularly primary health care, um, gets that services regardless of who they are or where they are. And we do that um, focusing on two main pillars. The first one is takeable pathways to primary health care. So looking at using um, a technology, modern technology, to better deliver primary health services to those mothers, women, children, men in, in the most remote last mile um, areas, but not just looking at geographically, but those that are being underserved even in urban areas. So things like our health center by phone technology where people can go in and get information about um, health services available to them, how to manage certain ailments. It's something that has proven very uh, pivotal actually during the, the management 
data. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is products to people. Um, so it's about how to change the way in which a lot of health systems are traditionally set up um, in sub-Saharan Africa, where the onus is on the patient to walk sometimes very long distances to get to clinics to access health commodities. So we want to change that to a point where we are using everything that's available to us, whether it be drones, whether it be community healthcare workers, to get the products to where those people are. So in a nutshell, that's that's what we do. I appreciate that. And, and my assumption, and to people, I'd love for you to weigh in here. My assumption is if we can make it easier for folks in need to acquire these supplies, um, the more supplies that they'll, you know, do, do you, do y'all, to Peter, do y'all see where uh, if, if it's too challenging for folks to get to where they can get the supplies, maybe they don't even try to do it. Is that what y'all see to Absolutely. Uh, you know, you're speaking the language that we love to hear. Uh, we describe that we want to make supply chains more people centered. Um, they must deliver services to people anytime anyway, where they want, uh, at the time that they want it, as conveniently as possible. Um, and, and this is a major shift from what we are seeing today. Um, what we have seen in a lot of places is that the responsible authorities deliver medicines to convenient places. Um, you know, a focus on health facilities as being the last mile. People have got to travel 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers to get to that health facility. Is that convenient? Is that the last mile? Is that where people want to receive their services? Is that how people want to receive their services? And so at Village, we challenge some of those assumptions and we ask, what is it that we need to do in the system to get products and services to where the people are? Um, and this is us executing a number of uh, interventions, uh, innovative in their own way, um, some traditional, but ones that bring products to where people are rather than people moving to where the products are. Okay. Thank As you. Can you. See, I'm, I'm, I'm typing along. There's so many nuggets that is coming out <laughs> over here. And I, it's very interesting because as I mean, for me from Supply Chain Africa perspective, as we're trying to create a hub for supply chain resource across the continent. We realize that our challenges differ. Uh, the big economies of Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa have different framework uh, and logistic concerns are completely different. The infrastructure concerns are completely different. And uh, what you guys are doing in Blade Ridge and, and how the last mile is being constructed is very unique and oftentimes borderline, uh, in my opinion, in some world, if you come from a Western world or Eastern world, like damn, this damn insane. You know, but you have to do what you have to do to get uh, what is needed to save life today. So the last one is quite critical. And that's why your, uh, when uh, Jenny introduced me to your operation, I found it very intriguing, very intriguing. And let me use this opportunity to say thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because this thing is thank needed. You, Our you. world needs this. Mm. Thank you. Well said. Oh, Adibai, as you were talking, um, something that you just said resonated. So. Scott, you asked earlier about where we work um, most often. Um, so we have um, countries like Malawi, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Mozambique, um, where, which are what the ones we call our core countries, um, where we have long engagements and really invested a lot in building partnerships with the governments who are you know, we believe the true stewards and, and custodians of, um, of public health services anyways. Um, but part of the reason why that partnership is so critical is that it enables the development of very context specific solutions. So, you know, the way that we might look at an intervention like drones for health in, in Malawi um, is a little bit different, has got some nuances that are specific to Malawi where we're doing, you know, bi-directional. We send um, health commodities and vaccines um, one way and we bring back lab samples um, as the reverse uh, logistic arm of it. 
which is different to the DRC, where we were dealing with a very um, specific challenge in, in the Equator province, where you have, and there's a video of this on YouTube uh, for those that have time. Um, I always remember that because it's one of the ones that I, I looked at when I was preparing for my village Ridge interview. Uh, but basically, it describes how you know drones are being used to transport um, commodities to a select number of health facilities that are hard to reach by car because the roads are are difficult. And you know where it was taking someone almost a day or two to get products from the central point to those clinics. We're sending drones, I think there are about four or five of them, like a daily run of drones to that facility so that people in that area have access to it. So it's about customizing the solutions to the need in the context. So back to the countries, three core countries that we work in, long engagements. And then we also have what we call partner countries where we have um, kind of medium term engagement. So those are um, Liberia, Tanzania, and Cote d'Ivoire, where we're doing work ranging from you know, high volume sites for, for COVID vaccines to um, a growing community health engagement uh, program, supply chain community healthcare workers. So sorry, just wanted to no, that's, chime in. That's, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just loving this. You have no idea of the love that I'm just getting from this because it, it shows about uniqueness of Africa as, as a continent uh, and, you know, 50 plus different countries operating differently and uh, we have different exposure culturally and how those things drives. And one of the things about supply chain Africa is uh, people, business and culture. And that's what drives, that's the fabric of African supply chain and most people have yet to actually conceptualize and let that idea kind of crystallize it to extent of creating a framework that work, you know, uh, that work for different. So as we continue to try to open doors, open different borders across Africa, and we want to see what Village Rich will have to do as far kind of leveraging those methodologies that is seen work in some culture and see, though they've kind of customized to a different culture, we want to see if those, if there a commonality in as they continue to move their last mile, is there a commonality that can be used regardless of geographic or cultural location. I'm actually looking forward to such an answer. If, I'm sorry to kind of derail from this. Uh, this is very interesting. I love it. I so love it. So why don't we, so if I can't, let's circle back to Adebayo's question there. We're going to get into uh, more supply chain observations from both Tapiwa and Tawange in a second, including we're going to touch more on the professionalization opportunity of supply chain management, in particular in public health. But before we do, if I can, move us along because I want to get Jenny back in. Jenny, Jenny's been observing. Uh, Jenny, I want to get to, why don't you ask about the big news with one Mackenzie Scott and then also move into you know, some of these supply chain issues that, that both of our guests have been observing in, in the last couple of years. Jenny. Yeah, so so thank you very much. I mean, I'm I'm more than happy just to sit and listen to this because this is this is not my job is done because there's still so much more to do, but to connect and to thank Scott again and again and again for giving us all this sort of forum for us to be able to come together to understand what each other is trying to do because you know, I'm, I am a great believer in collaboration and that together everyone achieves more. So here we go. <laughs> but you've had, some, I mean, Village Reach has just been the recipient of an amazing um, funding opportunity. And that's presumably going to create so many opportunities for you to do what you already do brilliantly, mm -hmm. but to be able to do it in a more meaning, not more meaningful, but in a bigger way. Do you want to tell us about that to Piwa? Sure, Jenny. Um, you know, this has been a very generous gift. Um, came as a surprise. Very welcome, nevertheless. Um, we're looking at this gift as a vote of confidence in the work that Village Reach, the people in Village Reach before us and, and present have been doing. Um, from the time we were a small organization um, supporting vaccine delivery and transforming the vaccine supply chain in Mozambique, uh, growing to over um, 12 countries that we are working in, in presently. And, and so um, we, we have a, a five-year strategy that we are implementing. Um, this generous gift allows us to 
invest in some of the program priorities um, that will lead to the micro shifts and the macro shifts to improve how healthcare services uh, get to people. Um, as an organization, as staff, of course, we uh, going to the draw boards, um, looking at our strategy, updating our strategy, uh, reflecting on what's going to be most impactful uh, with this generous gift. Um, I must say we thankful to Mackenzie Scott uh, for this generous gift and we hope through it we will be able to reach more people last year. Um, our impact was we were able through our interventions to reach 58 million people um, and I'm looking uh, 58 million people. I don't know how many families that will be. I don't know uh, how many lives saved that will be, yeah. but in the geographies that we work, uh, people's lives are needlessly lost. A high temperature yeah. that goes uncontrolled, um, a vaccine that is of poor quality making its way into the arms of patients and not doing the job that it must. And so um, we're really reflecting on this investment as another added possibility for us to be able to, to save just one more life and make a difference in the lives of families in Africa. Yeah, and it's yes. and it, and it's so 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 well so well invested I think I mean I was I re was reflecting on the statistics that you shared with with our student audience um, last year with what you moved from a PPE perspective to Wonge, do you want to share some of the not to put you on the spot to come up with numbers but I they were staggering and the speed with which you had to do it because of the pandemic. You know, um, I'm sure you saw the smile on my face when you were saying that. I think that's been one of the, the biggest highlights for me um, in this work. So, um, you know, you, basically when, when the pandemic kicked off, um, um, Emily Bancroft, our, our president, together with um, um, other um, organizations like Direct Relief, um, working through the Community Health Impact Coalition got together and said, you know, something needs to be done. There was an assessment done that basically said in order to protect community healthcare workers, and these are, you know, people that are part of the communities in the most rural parts of, of the continent, they're serving over a million um, families. Um, we need about 400 million pieces of PPE to protect these people every year so that they can continue going into people's delivering medicine, uh, doing prevention, messaging, and all of those things. So they got together and um, through some catalytic funding from direct relief that we can give them, um, you know, and, and additional um, generous gifts that were provided by several other donors, um, there was, and, and the numbers have improved, uh, Jenny. So we're now sitting at a total of $21.5 million that was raised and we managed to move and deliver 121 million pieces of PPE for community healthcare workers in the space of about a year. Um, and we have seen how, you know, just by making that PPE available, we have contributed to people continuing to access health services because there was a lot of fear for people to go to clinics, oh no, I might get infected, um, but if a, a CHW is coming to my home, then at least I can continue to get that care. So. It's been a highlight for me, um, and it's been quite a, an honor um, to be able to contribute to that. Mm, fantastic, absolutely amazing. Wow. I think it was 90, the, the number was 90 million, I think, when we last spoke. So that's a huge, 90.3 or something like that. So it's a huge, huge increase yes, and, a huge, and a huge difference. No, it is, a, it, it's really been massive. And you know, to put it in context, that, pretty much provides PPE for about a little over 400,000 CHWs to be able to work for six to, to 12 months, depending on their context. So, Fabulous. Love that. Um, well, let's keep going down that vein a little bit further, uh, Jenny, because um, we're talking about supply chain issues over the last couple of years, right? Yep. Yep. So what, so, so let's, let's obviously, um, Tawonga, you've shared what's been a real positive from, from your perspective in the last two years since the pandemic started. To people, obviously that's gonna be a similar, I mean, how do you top that? 
but but from a from a, a I don't know something maybe less dramatic what's been something that's really stood out for you and I only want positive we need positivity what's been a really positive thing that stood out for you that Village Reach has been involved in during the pandemic and, and I'm going to gonna say it you're on mute in the infamous words <laughs> of the virtual age <laughs> And I, I, I must say, what what works for me is um, in in the pandemic. You know, people in, in supply chain we say collaboration is the new com new competition. Yeah. Um, the pandemic has accelerated this. Organizations in the health space that have traditionally been competitors that have been working in the same space, duplicating efforts, have been able to collaborate at such a scale uh, that I don't think there's going to be any, any going back. Uh, in the particular initiative that Jenny, you were highlighting, we're talking about uh, over 30 organizations operating in over 20 countries uh, coming together to share resources, pool their funds, pool logistic capability, pool their advocacy with governments and that nature of collaboration in organizations that that have previously competed against each other has been a point of light for me it, it it says resources can be used more efficiently resources can be used more effectively the impact can be me measured more uh, in a more pronounced way um, and so I, i'm thinking that i hope in the future we're able to get the lessons learned and continue to collaborate at the scale that we collaborated during the pandemic. In that way, aid resources will be used more efficiently. Mm. I'm, really, I'm so, really looking forward to this conversation with Tuwange. Uh, she has agreed uh, Emmy to thank Tuwange mm. and uh, Villa Rich to uh, interview on our maiden edition of We may have lost out of bio, perhaps. Um, so, hey, this is the age we live in. Murphy's Law is alive and well. We'll pick back up on uh, out of bio's uh, thoughts in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, we do want to, I want to take a quick opportunity to echo what out of bio was saying earlier. I'm sure Jenny does too, to thank uh, the Village Reach team for all they're doing. You know, uh, what I heard Tawange say there a moment ago when, as she was adding context to these numbers was how that it becomes a force multiplier because it allows the healthcare community to help so many, so many others, right? Based on the, C, uh, the PPE that they now have. And, and, and as we've all learned these last two years, two and a half years or so, um, you know, protecting those that, that serve others, you know, so in, such an important thing. And, and one important aspect of the noble mission that global supply chain uh, certainly serves. Um, so I'm going to steal Adebayo's question here. And, and Jen, if you'd help me uh, keep an eye on the, uh, the, the, uh, the virtual uh, uh, green room and make sure we bring Adebayo back in. But I want to talk about, and uh, to Pete, well, let's start with you. I want to talk about um, the critical opportunity that is the professionalization, if I said that right, the professionalization of supply chain management in particular, in the public health community. So why is that so important and what is that opportunity to PY? So Scott, there's been a, a growing interest in the um, supply chain and more especially in the public health supply chain. Um, a lot of people are seeing opportunities for career growth, for career development. And the sector is inviting people, is attracting people from very diverse backgrounds um, some are coming from, you know, an engineering background. Others are coming from a pharmaceutical background, like Tiwonga says. Um, others are coming from a business background, like me. We have many that are also coming from a social science um, background. Um, we have others that have gone to school to study, you know, the skills. Uh, and we have others that have grown in the sector, developed the skills and through experience. Um, so there, there is so much diversity 
And what is really important is to make sure that uh, given the bold um, if ambitions we have for product availability, for efficiency, for effectiveness, there is, there is need to define the kind of critical skills and competencies that are going to get us to that goal, that are going to allow people that are crossing from other sectors to cover the gap in terms of what they need to know that they don't know. Um, we've got to be able to attract uh, top talent. Um, we're not going to be the sector that everyone falls for when they have nothing else uh, to do. And if we are going to, pro to, to attract top talent, there's got to be in, in a, a pathway to growth, a pathway to um, growing in the in, in the sector and in the skills. So I'm looking at professionalization as as an accountability mechanism that brings specialists, professionals in the sector to be accountable for what they need to be able to do and to declare what they are able to do. Um, it's also a mechanism through which we can foster um, skills transfer, skills growth, uh, because if we have a, a profession that's clearly distinct that's being taught in certain formal institutions, uh, these people that can be identified, that can, uh, like the process we are going through, transfer the skills to the young professionals. Um, and I look at professionalization as a path to, you know, being a recognized sector like the pharmacists, like the doctors, like the engineers, uh, in a way that standardizes the skills and competencies that people ought to have in the sector. Mm. Uh, wow. So Adebayo, welcome back. Uh, we, uh, we just had Tapiwa's answer on your question of the, the importance uh, of professionalization. Uh, why don't we do this? Let me have Tawange weigh in and then Adebayo, based on what you hear, heard, I know you're passionate about this as well. I'd love to get your take. Uh, on their responses here. And then we'll pick back up there. So Tawange, same question. The, pro the professionalization of supply chain management in particular in the public health community. Tell us about the opportunity and why it's so important. I think, you know, what, uh, what Tapu has just mentioned there is, is really key. You know, finding, um, providing a bit more clarity on the skills, the competencies, um, and making sure that those are communicated in a way that the people both the ones that are already in the system understand and can relate to and can see a pathway um, not only to you know, perhaps growing towards certain levels of ability, but also in being able to think through how best to engage, how best to collaborate with those individuals that are either within the system or those that are coming into the system um, to, to be able to participate. So, you know, I, I think back to the COVID pandemic. It's it's really been um, uh, the extent of of things. Um, we have had to work together to get information systems to to talk to each other to get the data to flow. That requires very strong and capable software engineers, um, business analysts that can you know get that to happen at pace and at scale. Um, we need the people that have the ability to leverage things like artificial intelligence and social listening to not only get the information, but be, be able to interpret what we are hearing through social platforms and others um, in a way that can be used to program um, our interventions. Uh, that's a very specific skill set. We need the, the core supply chain skills to be able to use all of those different pieces of of data to actually then make the decisions on, okay, we have this much stock here, it's going to expire on such and such a date. Where do we prioritize sending it? How do we prioritize targeting it through the areas where we're getting the messages? So I think having that clarity on the mix of skills that are needed, um, being able to clarify what that core skill set is, at least from a supply chain perspective, is, is something that will not only help clarify the career journeys for a lot of people, but I think it will also just enable the collaboration uh, conversation. So there's a lot of work that we're doing um, 
with organizations like the IAPHL, and I'm going to put Jenny on the spot just now for what that acronym stands for, um, <laughs> and uh, people that deliver as well. Um, but well, she, she's part of the team, I think, on that one. Um, yeah. So it's really about there is a whole body of work that is being done to clarify those things, to provide the frameworks, to provide the, the norms. Um, and we really need to be pushing um, the, the agenda in institutionalizing that in the countries, in, in systems, moving from, you know, here are the skill sets to how do we make sure that businesses and governments are creating the, the actual jobs that, you know, that uh, respond to those, those needs. All right. Wow. So I want to get, thank you, Tawange. So uh, uh, out of bio, I know that you're passionate about this. Tapiwa and Tawange just shared a lot about that professional professionalization. I can't say that word for some reason, uh, but out of bio. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think. Yeah. So I what is your. About it long enough and yeah, you can no say kidding. it in your sleep. Yeah. Well, so out of bio, what is your, what's your take here? Uh, my take is everything they've said is quite encompassing. And you know, the reason, and I always point out the reason why Supply Chain Africa, and I share this thing uh, intimately with, uh, with Jenny, the reason why Supply Chain Africa is why we kind of started this own initiative to be the ultimate resource for supply chain across the continent is we understand where Africa is and where Africa is going. And to get Africa to where it's going, Africa's supply chain needs to be well entrenched in certain principles and certain ideologies. Oftentimes, like just like uh, uh, Tapiwa said, you know, uh, you know, just professionalization of it is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that is going on. We have African feet, uh, feet African Continental Free Trade Agreement going on as well. It's quite instrumental to a lot of things that's going to be going on across the continent. But more importantly, is the uniqueness and the nuances that so that surrounds African supply chain. It's quite unique. It's nothing that is currently obtainable in the West nor in the East. It's different. Is like I said, it's well. There's cultural flavor to it. There's people flavor to it. And oftentimes, how we move things in Africa. You in the United States and the Europe's and uh, Asia would never understand it or will ever even conceptualize it. Uh, it's just a way of getting things from point A to point B. And the one is quite unique. And we shy away from this uniqueness. We think it doesn't fit the narrative that has been pushed out there. But what are we are saying is we need to embrace this uniqueness and nuances as our way forward, because this is how we're going to get to where we need to be. With Oftentimes, most of all these. Uh, you know, and, and to speak to the educational and professionalization aspect of it is the fact that all these things has to be documented, has to be curated. What is necessary to move supply chain in the Western world and where they have robust and developed infrastructure is currently different from what is obtainable in Africa. So we, the skill set is going to be different. Uh, the, the knowledge attributes that you need to carry on your, your function as a supply chain professional is completely really different. So we're trying to bring that for, uh, you know, we have to also make sure that supply chain is well respected. Everyone in Africa does supply chain. Our mothers are probably the most logistically inclined individuals I've met, you know, but all these skill sets are out there. Like uh, Tiwanga said, Africa is a mecca of data at the moment and nobody is earning or understanding it. So all these things are the prime, and I mean, they're not that they're prime yet, but it's 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 ready to be activated. And we need a supply chain professionals to be able to make sense of these and be able to position themselves and posture every time we So uh, what uh, Tapiwa and Tuanga said is just a part of it. This thing is a whole robust thing that needs to happen, that needs to engine, that is a part of the engine that needs to propel Africa forward. So we're looking for collaboration, we're looking for people with Part leadership to be able to contribute to this endeavor. I am sold on this. I'm so even I'm, I'm moving all my family from the US and I'm moving back to Africa. I said, you know what, we're going to do this. I don't think, I hope my wife's not listening to this podcast. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Well, so I'm so passionate about this. So I'm so, I'm so happy that, that Tapiwa and Tuwange is, is, is very, is very refreshing that what we are thinking on this side 
others are thinking on the other part of the continent. They also think that it's okay. So if everyone professionals are thinking about this, Jenny and the folks are thinking about this across the continent, it, it, it's showing that the time is right. The time is right to make this thing happen. And we are here to make time, it happen. The time is right. The time is now. So on, for the sake of time, uh, I want to start to bring this to close. We'll have to have y'all back. There's so much to the Village Reach story. There's so much to, uh, as Adebayo is saying, uh, the uniqueness of uh, the supply chain community across the continent, uh, all the different flavors and vibes. I love that, uh, Adebayo. Um, but let's make sure folks know how to connect with uh, both Tapiwa and Tuange with Village Reach. Let's start there. Uh, Tapiwa, how can folks connect with you and Village Reach? We right there. We're using new media. We're using social media. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So just look for me on LinkedIn. The name is Tapiwa Mkwashi. And look for Village Rich on LinkedIn as well. Um, we also trading as Village Rich on our Twitter handle. We on Facebook. Uh, on email, um, you can get me on tapiwa.mukwashi at villagereach.org. So uh, let's just that easy. through it. It's just that easy. It's just that easy. Uh, <laughs> and clearly a uh, big noble mission folks y'all check that out we're gonna we're gonna try to try to make that as easy as possible for both to piwa and tuange to list that one click away in the episode page uh tuange same question uh how can folks connect with you um and what you're doing everything to piwa said and tuange.mkandawire at villagereach.org wonderful <laughs> so um yeah well, so quick question, quick question uh, is LinkedIn when, when it comes to your, um, you know, how you comment and engage across social is LinkedIn, your y'all, your both uh, your channel, uh, your preferred channel, Twange? For me, yes, uh, my preferred channel is definitely LinkedIn. So on there, you'll be able to, um, you know, catch, you know, kind of keep up with um, what I'm involved in, what a lot of um, my team is involved in. Um, and, you know, the cross linkages to what the broader Village Reach team is doing. So LinkedIn and definitely Twitter um, is, is a good go-to. Um, but we recently launched our new website. It looks quite nice, if I may say so. Uh, so please uh, go to villagereach.org to uh, just get a little bit more about um, the organization. Love that villagereach.org listeners y'all check that out be sure be sure to connect with Tapiwa and Tawange uh, on LinkedIn and beyond and Tapiwa LinkedIn is good for you as well right fantastic all right Link, what, LinkedIn is the best content. wonderful um folks you know we say this often uh Jenny and Adebayo we're just not even barely scratching the surface to what uh leaders uh like our guests here are doing of course their organization and gosh, with um, the generosity of, of folks globally, including Mackenzie Scott, I love how they're going to be able to take that and, and go bigger, help more, move, you know, move mountains, really. Um, so, but out of bio, uh, as we start to, to uh, kind of wind things down, I want to get your favorite thing you heard from our panel here today. And then, of, co of course, we want to know how to connect with all the cool things you're doing. Awesome. The coolest thing I've heard uh, today is about, first, actually, I had two coolest things. Uh, one from uh, the PUI is about the institutionalization uh, of supply chain knowledge in Africa, institu institutionalization of it, which is bringing all this knowledge together and let's make it something that we can start practicing. Uh, great. We have certain things that I've always, that science and art to supply chain. Science is universal. Heart, the heart part of supply chain is not universal. It is very, very local. And uh, having to, you know, people in the same geographical space as in Africa, we need to start looking at common grounds. What works in Malawi? Can this thing actually work in Congo? Can it work in Nigeria? You know, you'd be surprised what can be done. Uh, so I, I love that concept. And also from uh, Tewenge, uh, the, the, the Mount Everest of support. I think that kind of resonates across the board. And as a parent as well, you know, kind of, I might give my kids the Mount Everest of support. Maybe I'm giving them King Lomanjara, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> I'm trying to see. Uh, but but it, it resonates well with me. So thank you. And please follow us on Supply Chain Africa and Adibaya Adilke LLC. 
uh, what we are doing in Nigeria, in Rwanda, in other parts of the country. And I'll follow us on that as we, you know, pushing towards the maiden edition of it. And thank you to Wange for volunteering to, uh, to be one of our interviewers on our ed first edition. Uh, and the village is going to be front and center on what they've done during COVID. It's, 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 very, it's a healthcare kind of meeting edition about African. Thank you, Jenny, so, you know, CEPIX and, you know, African Supply Chain Excellence Award, all the thing that we guys, you know what, we hold a depth of gratitude. So thank you. And of course, Scott, the supply chain now, you guys are the awesome. You guys are the original Bam Bam Jiggy Jiggy. You know, so thank you. <laughs> you know? Well, I appreciate, uh, again, it's about deeds, not words. And this panel here, and they live it out every day. Uh, so thank you for those thoughts out of bio. Uh, we're, we're kindred spirits, especially on the uh, Mount Everest of support. They'll forever stay with us. Uh, Jenny, man, there, there's too much to get to here uh, in this episode. But Jenny, what's one thing that sticks out? And of course, how can folks connect with you and Safex? I, I think that in a nutshell, there's a lot that, that melded together. And I think that it all comes back to inspirational community and what we get from our community. You know, everybody said amazing things, but it's also a situation that if we continue to work in our silos and in isolation and we don't communicate, then we will never be able to make the supply chain profession a profession because we're all doing similar things, but up until recently, nobody really knew what everyone was doing. So communication, community, all of which will ultimately end up being inspirational. So I think that, that that's how I would sum up the discussion. Um, and again, a great thanks to, to Scott and the team for, for this amazing platform. Um, you can find me through the through SAPIX, www.sapix.org, or LinkedIn, and particularly I prefer Twitter because it's far less formal. So I like to have a little bit of fun in, and chat, and Scott and I share lots of fun things, including food uh, on Twitter. So join us it's fun join us please food flowers dogs uh you name it we enjoy uh every you know love supply chain but it's nice to take a break from time to time and jenny uh, always a pleasure uh folks make sure you connect with each of these four steam leaders i'll tell you you won't regret it uh big thanks to jenny Froom and say picks big thanks to Adabio adilike and what they're doing at supply chain africa a lot of good stuff coming there if you can't tell uh, a little bit of passion on this panel here today. So great to have you uh, here out of bio as part of our uh, uh, supply chain leadership across Africa series. Of course, our featured guests here today, Tapia um, Mukwashi and T uh, Tuange M. Um, M. Kanawiri. M. Kanawiri. I think uh, my apologies. It's so important to get names right. You know, I, I think I tell the story. My last name uh, to many looks like Lutton but it's Luton, like Luton, England. And the first day of school with reliability, every single time the teacher would get that wrong and it, it never feels good. So, but Hey, Tapiwa and Tawange, most importantly, um, love what you're doing. Uh, congratulations on really the impact that, that your professional journeys are having your teams, um, the, the village reach organization. And, you know, we love, you know, speaking for our supply chain now team here, perhaps for Jenny and Adebayo, when great things happen to great people that are doing great things in the industry, that is truly uh, the best news we can all celebrate. So uh, we look forward to reconnecting with y'all again soon. Big thanks. Folks, make sure you check out villagereach.org. And to all of our listeners out there, on behalf of our entire Supply Chain Now team, hey, be like this panel here. Goodness gracious. Uh, do good give forward and be the change that's needed on that note. We'll see you next time right back here at supply chain. Now. Thanks everybody. Thanks for being a part of our supply chain. Now community, check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to supply chain. Now, anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on supply chain. Now. Now.